glad you brought those up. So those are more directly related to your actual research. So maybe we can dive into talking about the intermediate long wavelength equation, which we'll just call as ILW. ILW, yeah. Also intermediate is a long wave, yeah. <laughs> and then the Benjamin Ono. So maybe we can start with the intermediate long wavelength. What is that? Long wave. Long, long wave. wave equation. Yeah. Long wave. Okay, so, so it's it's still a uh, it's very it's it's very similar to the KDV equation. It's the physical situation is at least very similar. But it's a, it's a fluid, you have a fluid setup where there's a ceiling and a floor and there's a fluid in between, but it has a slightly different density below than it does above. And there's some interface that you usually refer to as a picnicline, which is just a line where the density changes rapidly. So um, a good example of this would be like the ocean. Um, the ocean has different layers that have different salt content which changes the density slightly. And there are regions where the density sort of changes rapidly from one salt content to another. And that picnocline in between is a surface, we think of it as a, as a, as a surface, that if you modeled this in one dimension, in one spatial dimension, one time dimension, um, would be well governed by the ILW equation, uh, which is, but it, the requirement is that the oscillations of the surface are have a small amplitude, um, so that we can do some approximations to the, to the full fluid dynamics equations. The, uh, lower section of fluid has like a fixed depth and, um, relative to the wavelength of disturbances that you're interested in modeling, the top fluid is very shallow compared to that. Um, so that's the situation that, uh, yields the intermediate long wavelength equation. Long wave. You got me saying no, I it. I got now. you saying it now. You got me saying <laughs> it. The long wave equation. So the intermediate part is, uh, well, the long wave part is that we're looking at wavelengths that are long compared to that top fluid uh, depth. Um, you can see why I made that mistake. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they are long wavelengths. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, but the intermediate part is that if you take that bottom depth, if you take that bottom depth to be very shallow too, you'll recover the KDV equation for the, that would describe the oscillations of, of the surface of the picnocline in between the two fluids. And if you took that depth to be infinite, you would get what's known as the Benjamin Ono equation, which is another, just another integrable nonlinear partial differential equation. So I have these three partial differential equations. Uh, we can take the ILW, which is sort of in between, let's yeah. say the KDV and then the Benjamin Ono. Mm -hmm. And in certain limits, you recover one or the other. Right. And did your research focus on the ILW mostly, the Benjamin Ono? Where do you take it from here? Yeah, my research was mostly on the, the ILW equation. Um, so the idea is Jake, you fix that depth, that bottom depth, and then you ask what do solutions to the ILW equation look like? So it was already known as of the 70s um, that the ILW equation had an infinite number of conserved quantities and was integrable and had this same inverse scattering, inverse scattering technique of solutions. Um, but it wasn't, it's not mathematically, it wasn't as rigorous as um, the KDV equation. Uh, but the one thing that was rigorous about the uh, intermediate long wave equation was the, um, the multi-soliton solution. So you can write down exactly what the solution is if you have a, a finite number of solitons, n of them, say. Um, so what was done also in the, I believe the late 60s, maybe early 70s, was um, David Levermore and Peter Lax, who are my great grand advisor and my grand advisor, i.e. the advisor of my advisor, and his advisor. <laughs> we got some academic genealogy over here. Yeah, exactly. The they did a they worked out um, how if you start with a really broad initial condition to the KDV equation, uh, you'll find that there are a lot of solitons in it. There's the solitons themselves are related to the eigenvalues of the Schrodinger equation. So this is known as the semi-classical problem in the Schrodinger equation when an initial condition is very, or a, a potential is very broad, there will be a lot of eigenvalues that uh, sit at, that sit inside of that potential, sort of. And um, what they found, what uh, Lax and Levermore did, was they showed how the solution of these 
lots of solitons sort of coherently add in the beginning and then how they break into the little solitons that come out afterwards. The same so, thing that happened with the FPUT yeah. problem. Yeah, what uh, they were, exp what they showed, what Zabuski and Kruskal were looking at, um, sort of, uh, you know, uh, numerically simulating on the computer. Um, Lax and Levermore showed in a more rigorous mathematical way exactly how that works, and in particular what the limit as uh, the initial condition goes to infinity, what it starts, what that solution looks like, and how to describe it. Um, so I wanted to do that for the ILW equation. And because the uh, n-soliton formula was known, um, I can sort of start by building out a very broad initial condition with a bunch of solitons in it, and then ask what happens as we evolve that solution um, under time and how this, see how the solitons break. So actually, I was only able to show, to compute what that limit is before the solitons break in my thesis to show rigorously that it does approach some specific profile um, uh, solution to Invisit Berger's equation that I mentioned before. Um, but the, uh, I'm, still, I'm still currently trying to work out what the, what, how it breaks and what governs the dynamics of the system after the fact. We still expect that it should be a bunch, we should see each of the solitons in a little generating this, what's known as a dispersive shock wave. Um, but the, but we just, uh, we aren't exactly sure what the math that describes it is. Sort so of your dissertation went up to the breaking point where the solitons are expected to start flying yeah. off, let's say. Yeah. Um, and now you're a postdoc and you're continuing this work. So right. what I'm curious about is in the KDV case, or let's say the FPUT case, um, people did understand how those solitons emerge. Right. But why is it harder in the ILW case? Why is it that uh, it doesn't follow, let's say, analogously how you would treat that regime? Well, uh, we, we do expect that it will follow analogously. Um, the mathematics that govern the solution after that breaking in KDV, there it's, uh, well, I guess you'd say it's really high level mathematics. It has to do with um, algebraic varieties uh, hyperelliptic surfaces, stuff like that. Um, there's a lot of interesting complex analysis that goes into it. Uh, Are you trained on these things or do you have to read up on your own and, and relearn some things? Uh, the, learn some the, things from scratch. The algebraic, um, the algebraic varieties and the hyperelliptic surfaces, that was like, that was the thing that I was least prepared for definitely going into the, into my PhD. And yeah, I just had to like read about, read about it a bunch and try to understand it. And now for KDV, I think I understand what's going on there uh, pretty well. But the for ILW, there it's just not it's not known yet what the ILW version of those like algebraic varieties or uh, hyperelliptic surfaces are. There's a couple papers um, that describe that attempt to describe what's going on there, but really I just haven't been able to parse it well enough. To see, uh, to see exactly how I can construct my solution and show that my limit, the limit works in my for my uh, the problem that I'm looking at with these so, many solitons. Work in progress. Yeah, work We're in progress. There. Um, yeah. Do you have any ideas? Uh, what do you hope to tackle in your postdoc aside from continuing the ILW work? Yeah. So the um, right now I'm working on. Um, that problem that I was talking about with uh, KDV, the uh, the solution that they found uh, up until break time, they were able to show that the limit that the solution approached a particular limit um, uh, with like pretty good errors. They knew what the error was between the limit that they were looking at and the actual solution, right? Um, after break time, they didn't know what the error was, but they could still show that the limit approached it, that it still, that the solution approached the limit, but they didn't know what the error was essentially. So, so they one couldn't problem, tell you how exactly, how fast, for example, or how accurate the solution gets closer. Yeah. 
Yeah. If you're to... interested in knowing, if you're interested in knowing, uh, like for this sort of a situation, this fluid dynamic situation, you're interested in knowing like exactly where those peaks are of the solitons, right? And that's kind of the information that they didn't have is because these peaks, if you're a little bit offset from the peaks, you could be far from the actual solution there because it dips, stuff like that. So I've been working on generating with another postdoc here at uh, UCF. I've been working on um, getting asymptotics, getting error estimates on this asymptotic limit um, that basically tells you kind of where those peaks are of the solitons coming out of the coming out of the wave breaking. Um, and then also there's a similar problem, a related problem for the nonlinear Schrodinger equation that I'm working on um, with the the same postdoc and some professors here. So I've got my hands full with uh, with new projects too. So some viewers might be interested in trying to connect what you're doing to the more general case of fluid dynamics, which is the Navier-Stokes equations. Yeah. And perhaps one can ask, is there any relationship at all between KDV and ILW to the more general Navier-Stokes equations, or do those live in different realms? Well, they, they are definitely related. Like they, these, so the KDV and ILW equations are derived from Navier-Stokes or really they're derived from, well, a simplification of Navier-Stokes, which is the, oil, the in, incompressible Euler equations. Um, but it's in this very specific regime that these equations end up coming out. Um, the regime being you need small amplitude oscillations, you need long wavelength compared to some other uh, physical um, dimensions in the problem, stuff like that. So the, uh, they're very, they're very simplified equations from Navier-Stokes that come from Navier-Stokes. Uh, but the interesting thing is that the nonlinear term in Navier-Stokes is basically the exact same nonlinear term in these equations. Um, so it's, I don't know, it's still not really known exactly if they're, if these integrable properties exist in the Navier-Stokes equation or not. Um, but nobody's been able to find it yet. So that's the whole deal with the Navier-Stokes equation is, is that they're, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a more general equation. So it's a lot harder to solve, a lot harder to find um, solutions and everything. So 